Habakkuk was written around 607 B.C. Judah was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Chaldeans around 605. So two years before the destruction of Judah, where Habakkuk is the prophet, he said these words. Perplexed by God's not acting, because Judah was so far gone, so sinning, that he's perplexed that God doesn't act and discipline them, and then God does, and then he's perplexed by the harshness of the discipline. We know in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 that God tells all of us today that he says, if someone loves you, they discipline you. If they don't love you, they don't discipline you. And it says that discipline is very difficult, as we could see in this video when these kids played with paint and they weren't supposed to. But here in Judah, it is not a laughing matter. Matter of fact, they have gone very far south. They have colored way outside the lines, and uh, God is basically, he's fed up. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1. This is a message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you don't listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you not, don't come to save. Must I forever see this, these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery wherever I look? I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded, I am surrounded by people who, who love to argue and fight. The, the law has become paralyzed. And there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. There's a problem. Problem, he, Habakkuk the prophet, the voice of God, sees it, and he says, okay, what's up with that God? Now, you and I will often have things coming up in our life. We'll see somebody prosper that we think should not because they cheated, they lied, they color outside the lines, and we go, God, why do you allow these people in the marketplace to succeed when they're bottom liners and they're bottom feeders and they don't care about their people, all they care about is profit. Us, on the other hand, we're actually trying to do what is right and we're having a hard time even getting by. How come we're trying to do what's right and other people are cheating and they seem to be succeeding? And that's what Habakkuk has seen in Judah. Judah, who are supposed to be men and women of, of God, who had received the rules and the regulations from God, and they, they lived with them for a while, and then they just put them aside. And now they have just become, you know, sin and debauchery has just taken over their, their city, their lifestyle. Now Judah is the smaller of the uh, 12 tribes. Judah is the bottom two. Israel is the northern 10. So Judah's uh, down here. Israel's up here. There's only two tribes. But you guys that have, have studied the Bible and in the Old Testament, you know that they always screw up. We looked at Nineveh last week, and when Jonah went to Nineveh, Nineveh repented because God showed mercy on it. It only took 150 years later for them to screw up, and then the God to wipe them off the face of the earth. And it seems like a pattern, as you guys have become studiers of the Old Testament, that people are okay, then they screw up, they get beat up, punished, they're okay, punished. It's just like... You would think a mature person would go, okay, I get it. Why don't I just do what's right? Now, we're going to see that there are some people, <clears throat> even in Judah, that they live by faith. They are just, and the just shall live by faith, and God will take care of them, just like God will take care of you. You know, because sometimes as a man or woman of God, we walk the road less traveled by. We go right down the middle. Everybody's going this way, and we're going that way. So sometimes just to be a man of God, to be a woman of God is sometimes very difficult. And sometimes we bumped and we start going the wrong way and maybe a friend or something happens in our life and we figure out how to get back to where we're supposed to be going. So this prophet of God who says these words, and this was written around 607 B.C., two years later, 605 B.C., they're destroyed. So this is God's reply. So whenever you pray, and I, I believe this still today, whenever you pray, just beware of the answer God may give you. <coughs> Verse 5, the Lord replied, look around at the nations, look and be amazed, for I am, 
I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. I am rising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. <clears throat> if you have a, a King James, it might say the Chaldeans, same, okay? A cruel and violent people, they will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than, che than cheetahs and fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their char char charioteers charge from far away like eagles. They swoop down to devour their prey. Oh, they come, all bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. They scoff at kings and princes and scorn at all their fortresses. They simply pile up ramps on er of earth against their walls and capture them. They sweep past like the wind and are gone, but they are, deeply, but they are deeply guilty for their own strength is their God. So, there's a problem. God point, uh, he points it out to God. It's not like God didn't see it. God gives him this answer, verses 5 through 11, and the answer is, I'm raising up a people, the, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, they're going to come in. They're great horsemen. They have chariots. And if you ever watch those 300 movies or those movies from that time period, you know, the horses have those big chest plates on with those big sp spikes sticking out of them and uh, swords and spears. And they, they, they come up to the walls and they just build a ramp and, and then they just wreak havoc. And that's what they did. That was, he goes, this is the picture that I'm giving you. This is what is going to happen to Judah. You asked me if I was doing anything, and um, God's like, yeah, I am. I'm doing something. So Habakkuk says, uh-oh, here we go. Verse 12, O Lord my God, my Holy One, who are you, you who are eternal? Surely you don't plan to wipe us out. Isn't that a good one? Now wait a second. Wait, stop. Don't, don't read that. So you, ask, you give a prayer, and you go, dear God, I really love this person, this guy, this girl. I want to marry them. They're so sweet. You know, what do you say? And then you meet that person. They go, oh, I don't like you at all. I'm going somewhere else. Oh, God, I did not want that answer. Do you ever get one of those God that answers that you wait? Oh, dog, God. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. How's that, Megan? Megan goes, Dad, you got to do voice exercises before you speak. <laughs> Dear God, we believe you brought us to this neighborhood, to this beautiful house for us to purchase. Our realtor says we qualify, that the, everything will go through, and then God says, no. Has God ever said no to you? Raise your hand if you ever heard no. How many of you guys like no's? Nobody. Uh, no. Really? Because when God says no, we go, I wonder how we can get around the no. Right? It's got to be a loophole. So that's Habakkuk. Habakkuk sees this terrible things that's going to happen to Judah. So he goes, oh, Lord, my God, my holy one, you who are eternal. God, wait, don't you remember? You're nice. Right? But you're a good God. Why is this happening now to me, to my family, to my city, to my county, to my nation? Now, here's what's cool about the minor prophets. They're men of God. Their integrity depends on them speaking the truth. If you do not speak the truth, you die. That's how it is with a prophet. If you lied, you died. People would say, well, how do you know if it was true or not? Because if a prophet ever got it wrong, they took him outside and they killed him. It was real simple. You either spoke the truth and lived, or you spoke a lie and you died. Pretty, pretty simple. So, <clears throat> verse 12, O Lord, we'll, we'll make it further now. O Lord, my God, my Holy One, you who are eternal, surely you do not plan to wipe us out. O oh Lord, our rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins, but you are pure and cannot stand the, the sight of evil. Will you, will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while 
the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? Are we only fish to be caught and killed? Are we only sea creatures that have no leaders? Must we be strung up on their hooks and caught in their nets while they rejoice and celebrate? Then they will worship their nets and burn their incense in front of them. These nets are not the gods who have made us rich, they will claim. These nets are the gods who have made us rich, they will claim. Will you let them get away with this forever question? Will they succeed forever in their heartless conquest? That's, that's, that's the question. You know, and it's funny because the pictures that God gives Habakkuk are, they would be like, like real time of real events that really happened because the people would be captured with nets. And you guys that have ever heard me t- teach this before, a, a means of k- taking captives away would be putting lip uh, hooks through their lip and then hooks through the person behind them, their lips. And so they would be hooked like fish and they would march them away. Because if anybody ran, it would be pretty evident because everybody's lips would be shredded. So that is the way they took them away. And this is the picture that God gave them, that God gave Habakkuk. of. This is what's going to happen to the disobedient people in Judah. They say they love me, but they don't. They no longer worship the one true living God. They worship their stuff. They have decided to go to the iron workers, to the potters, and make some stuff make up some gods and worship those gods instead of the one true living God. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of them robbing people, of abusing people, of pillaging the poor, of not taking care of the needy. I'm so tired of it that they're going to be done. And so that's it. I'm done with it. And they're going to be taken away captive. <clears throat> now, we know that, Jew, that Habakkuk's pretty upset about this. So he's like, well, what am I going to do? And I, we cannot necessarily uh, take these truths that we find in the minor prophets and and melt them into the age of grace, you know, in, in the New Testament. Because thank God there's grace, because we all deserve, as we learned a few weeks ago, we all, we're all sinners. We all deserve to be punished. But because God's love, God's grace, because we're just sinners saved by grace, he just, we're covered by that blood of Christ, and, and, and it's okay. It's not okay, but it's okay. But God t- told Judah, you, you've screwed up royally. And I'm sending the Chaldeans. I'm selling the Babylonians. And even though, you know, we're looking at Habakkuk going, but God, you are so good. You're, you're gracious, God. How can you let these people who are even more evil than, than the Judeans to come and just do this? So uh, Habakkuk says, I, I got to do something. You know, I, I have to do something. I can't just sit back. So chapter 2 is, uh, is, is another answer. He says, uh, Habakkuk says, I will climb up to, the wa- up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post, post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Of course, his complaint is, why these bad people who are badder than our bad people are going to allow for this to happen. Little note in my Bible says this is the Lord's second reply. Then the Lord said to me, Habakkuk, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This, is, this vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Look at the proud. Now, if you guys have a Bible, I want you to take out your pen and, and underline, look, out the, look at the proud. If, it, if you have a Bible, if, you got, if somebody else has a Bible and they're not doing it, take their Bible, underline it, look at the proud. Um, if, you, if you have a pen, you can write it on your hand. I'm, I'm not going to because my wife will yell at me and I don't want to get in trouble. Um, make a tattoo at it. Look at the proud, look at the proud. Because what have you guys learned? For you guys that have been with me, all through these minor prophets, what does he say about pride? What does he say about pride? It comes before the fall. 
And it doesn't it seem the Edomites were proud. God smashed them. Nineveh, they figured they didn't need to God. They became proud. What happened? God smashed them. Isn't it amazing that, that when we, we look at the difficult times that people have in obeying God, is they come, they all come to a point in their life where they think the world, how many of you guys may remember fifth grade science besides me? Fifth grade science, anybody? Fifth grade science? I think it was in the 60s for me. Fifth grade science. And in our fifth grade science class, I wish I had this thing. I had no idea what it was in fifth grade science. I do now. But it had a big blue ball, and it had another little ping pong ball here, and then it had a big orange ball over here, and you would spin it, and everything evolved around this blue ball. The blue ball was Earth, the little white ping pong ball was the moon, and the orange thing was the sun. And it was cool, and like, okay, I didn't like science in fifth grade at all, but uh, it, was, it was a machine, and I like machines a lot. So I would go, hey, this is really cool, I have no idea what, but it was 24 hours a day, and uh, the sun or the moon and everything went around each other. Okay, you get that? All right, that, that was like, listen, when you, Disney World, when they teach you how to speak, they say what you need to do is you need to give people's brain a second to relax. Okay, that was it. That was your relax second. That's all you get. So here, here's what the problem of pride is, is you think, look at the person next to you. Look at him, stare at him. Give it a chance. This is your chance. Just stare at him. Look at him. Say, okay, everybody, now done. We're done. You think the world revolves around you. That's pride. You think everybody should pay attention to you. It's, it's more than a godlike complex. It's, there's a serious pride issue. I guarantee that everybody can go through the Rolodex or the hard drive in their mind and say to themselves, I can think of one or two people that whenever I'm with them, all they think about, all they talk about is, that's right. And isn't it interesting when people have spiritual uh, explosions, have catastrophes in their life, most of the time, pride comes before the fall. Humility of what am I doing for others? God, how can I bless somebody else? Instead of having a grateful heart, they have a hard heart. And it's so interesting as we, you guys that have been with us as we've gone through these minor prophets, the problem and, and the, uh, uh, the answer to the problem was pride every time right before these, either Israel or Judah, got hammered. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Come on, you guys, take your Bibles. For you guys that were here, turn to uh, Micah chapter 6. And I know you guys underlined verses 8 and 9. But remember the problem back there was still pride. And God said, how can you fight that pride? What can you do to survive as a man of God or as a woman of God that back then he said Micah chapter 6 verse 8 says no O people the Lord has told you what is good and that what is required of you and, and, and I believe this to be still today what is required of you you guys that say I'm a Christian raise your hand you say hey I love God he died for me I love the Lord I'm a Christ follower yeah right raise it proud I mean Micah where's where Sudich he's He's really jacked about being a Christ follower. Now, 45 years, didn't go to church, really believe in the Lord, fall out. Now he's helping some lady put cat food, cat litter, and he's a dog guy. I'm surprised he just didn't leave it and say, oh, sorry, I'm a, 
I run the dog training club in Great Falls. There's no way I'm touching cat litter. But he didn't. He threw it in there. And uh, he was blessed. So this is, this is what God says he requires. And I think it's still so simple today, and we should all live by this. No, people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what is requires you to do what is right. Three things, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your Lord. I mean, wouldn't that just be the best friend in the world? You would be the best friend of the world if you could just do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. See, I think that's all of our greatest, that's my greatest struggle, you know, is to know that I am just, I'm just a, a tool in God's work belt. You know, if God chose, chooses you to be an instrument to minister to other people, you need to know that Satan wants you to screw up. You need to know that the days that you're physically tired, that you're emotionally spent, Satan will use those days for you to say stupid things to maybe destroy somebody's life. How do I know? Because I've done it. So you got to be, as a man of God, as a woman of God, you really need to be, try to be on top of your game. And here's the most important thing that you guys got to understand for you guys that love the Lord. The people that you will hurt the most are not the people that are not closest to, to you. The people you will hurt the most are the people that are closest to you. I mean, that's the reality in all of our lives. Your sons, your daughters, your husband, your wife. The ones you need to treasure the most are the ones you will hurt the most. So those three things that we need to do, we need to do what is right to love mercy and walk and if you want to know if you're not walking humbly ask someone very close to you and they'll instantly let you know how humble you are or not and honestly you shouldn't even have to ask you should should be able to figure that out <clears throat> so we see that the, the, the greatest struggle is, is, is pride so he says, look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. Wealth is treacherous and the arrogant are never at rest. They open their mouth as wide as the grave. And like death, they are never satisfied. In their greed, they have gathered up many nations and swallowed many peoples. But soon their captives will taunt them. They will mock them, saying, What sorrow awaits you, thieves? Now you will get what you deserve. You've become rich by extortions, but now, but how much longer can this go on? Suddenly, your debtors will take action. They will turn on you and take all you have. While you stand trembling and helpless, because you have plundered many nations, now all the s survivors are, will plunder you. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled the towns with violence. What sorrow awaits you. And he goes on. Let's jump down to uh, chapter 3 so we can get out of here before 6 o'clock tonight. Because uh, it, it, I want you to, you know, later today, whenever, read the rest of chapter 2. But let's look at the, the person, the power, and the purpose, and the praise. This prayer was sung by the prophet Habakkuk. I have heard... I'm sorry, are we there, Nancy? I'm, I'm sorry, Habakkuk chapter 3. I know not everybody brought your... Here we go. That's good. Chapter, verse 2, we'll start in verse 2. It's good. Um, I have heard about, I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of your deep need, of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. You know, I hope each one of you in your personal life, knowing God the Father through His Son, Christ, I hope each one of you remember God's mercy in your life. Because if you remember God's mercy in your life, 
you will remember the mercy that you need to dish out to somebody else. So, verse 3. I see, I see God moving across the desert from Edom, the Holy One coming from Mount Paran. His brilliant splendor fills the heavens, and the earth is filled with his, with his praise. His brilliant splendor fills the heavens, and the earth is filled with his praise. His coming is a brilliant as the sunrise, sun rays of light flash from his hands, where his awesome power is hidden. Patience marches before him, plagues, uh, pestilence, sorry about that. Did you like that? Patience would have been nicer than pestilence. But. Pestilence marches before him, plagues, this is his power, uh, plagues follow close behind. When he stops, the earth shakes. When he looks, the nations tremble. He shatters the everlasting mountains and levels the eternal hills. He's the eternal one. I see the people of Kushan in distress and the nations of Midian trembling in terror. What, was, it, was it in anger, Lord, that you struck the rivers and parted the sea? Uh, were you displeased with them? No, you were sending your chariots of salvation. You brandished your bow and your quiver of arrows. You split open the earth with flowing rivers. The mountains watched and trembled. On, onward swept the raging waters. The mighty deep cried out, lifting its hands to the Lord. The sun and the moon stood still in the sky as your brilliant arrows flew and your glittering spears flashed. You marched across the land in anger and trembled and, and trampled the nations in your fury. You went out to rescue your chosen people, to save your anointed ones. You crushed the heads of the wicked and stripped their bones from head to toe. With his own weapons, you destroyed the chief of those who rushed out like a whirlwind, thinking Israel would be easy prey. You trampled the sea. You trampled the sea with your horses and the mighty waters piled high. I trembled inside when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear. My legs gave, be, gave way beneath me, and I shook in terror. I will wait quietly, quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and, are, and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yes, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as a sure footed makes me as sure footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. And that's the praise of God. That's the purpose and that's the praise because of faith in God. After everything God shows to Habakkuk, his his problem, his answer, his why, he's perplexed, and then at the end of his his writing, he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. When you're too proud, you don't get to rejoice in the Lord. You just rejoice in yourself. But Habakkuk goes, oh, wait a second. I will rejoice in the Lord because my joy does not come from what surrounds me. My joy comes from what's within me. That's the Lord.